I'm Bart Massey. I guess we will get started. It looks like it's officially time now. And if people come in late, well, it's good to be them. Uh, this talk is called Probably. Um, I named it that somewhat obtuse name because it's sort of vaguely a sequel to last year's talk, which was entitled Random. Um, and I'm a professor at Portland State, been there about 15 years, um, just finishing up, literally just finishing up in yesterday, a, a year-long sabbatical there and getting back into the swing of teaching and stuff. Um, I've been doing things that are open sourcey and giving them away since I was a kid, um, since before we had names like open source or free software. So I like doing this stuff. I've always had fun shipping floppy disks around and later tapes and then, oh yeah, then there was this dial-up networks and stuff. Um, and uh, one of my passions, one of the things that I get excited about uh, is the idea that the more tools you can bring to the job, the more you understand what's going on in the world, the better you're going to be as a developer and as an engineer. Um, you know, I don't think technology for technology's sake itself is particularly pointful, but um, I think having tools at your disposal to solve the problems that you have um, is really cool. And uh, one of the areas where people need to think hard about this kind of stuff is in the area of probability. Um, probability is an interesting thing because, um, you know, as the take home message says, probability is that doesn't say okay, it doesn't say don't know, it says Dunning Kruger, which is to say that, um, you know, if if you think you understand it really well, then probably you're in that bottom quartile of understanding and need to have your understandings improved. Um, that's not an insult, it's just a matter of fact because we make a bunch of mistakes when we talk about probability. And by we, I mean the collective education system, blah, 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 um, that make it a problem for people. And part of the problem is that we give you these simple explanations of what's going on and how it works, which are so simple that they're more misleading than true. And so what I want to do today is sort of several things. The first thing I want to do is explain why, what's hard about it and why it's hard, talk a little bit about how confusing it can be and how you can get confused. And then I want to talk a little bit about some of the tools you can use to get, mathematical tools you can use to get yourself unconfused. Yes, there's math in this talk, I apologize. But it's not much math and it shouldn't require any deep math knowledge. And if, frankly, if you eyes glaze over at all of it, you'll still probably get something out of the talk. So I think we'll be okay. Um, and then I want to show some applications, talk about some things, and then We'll be happy to be out of here, I'm sure. Um, having said that, I'm a professor. If you let me, I'll stand here in lecture mode and blah, 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 blah at you until you're all bored stiff. That's no good. Um, I'm really, really happy to have you ask questions, to make comments, to ask me to re-explain, you know, whatever it is, you know, let's talk. I don't really need to talk at you. This talk, I was very careful to keep short enough that there's plenty of time to have a discussion in the middle of it. And if we don't get to the, everything in it, oh no, that's not the end of the world either. Good enough? Yeah. Cool, cool. So let's have some fun. So um, I want to start with a problem probably most of you have seen before, but I still think it's worth talking about for various reasons. And that's the um, Monty Hall problem. Um, how many people are familiar with the Monty Hall problem? Almost everybody in the room. All right, then we can do this really fast because there isn't that much to say. Um, the, for the one or two people who didn't raise their hand, on the game show Let's Make a Deal, there used to be a thing that was sort of a ritualized thing that a mathematician modeled as. Um, you pick a door. Behind two of the three doors are randomly chosen goats, notionally. And behind the third door is a valuable prize. And uh, you pick a door that you want. And Monty, in the ritualized second step of this deal, says, well, you know what? I'll show you that behind one of the doors you didn't choose, there is a goat. Uh, that's a goat. It's not a Cthulhu. I just can't draw. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, so the Cthulhu or goat or whatever it is is behind one of the doors you didn't choose. And then Monty, in the ritualized third step of this adventure, um, offers you a choice. You may remain with the door you chose originally, or you may choose the third door. Um, as 
you know, you can change your mind about which door you should have picked. Now, most of you raised your hand and said you're familiar with the problem, so I'm going to guess that I know the answer to this. But how many people believe that it, you know, first of all, how many people believe that you'll get better odds by sticking with the door you started with? That doesn't make any sense, right? There's no reason, you know, what were my odds? There were two goats and one prize arranged randomly. What were my odds at the start of this thing? One third, yeah. So, I mean, it's not going to get better now, right, if, by, if, by staying where I am. That's not a thing. How many people think my odds will get better by switching, though? Yeah, almost everybody. And that's correct, right? And what we want to talk about, what I want to talk about um, is how so many people get that wrong. Because it isn't super obvious. There's two things in conflict here. And I wager that how many people the first time they heard this got it wrong? Yeah, exactly. So that's the interesting question, right? Is how did our intuitions mislead us so horribly when we first heard this problem? Um, and the answer is that there's two warring intuitions about probability at play here, right? One is the intuition that says, um, you know, once you've made your choice, revealing more information can't tell you anything. Um, you know, the other one is the intuition that, that you all, all got right at the end that says that, um, you know, you, you had a low chance before and there's one other choice, it must have a high chance. Uh, that second intuition is harder to find for some reason. And the reason that I'm excited about talking about the Monty Hall problem is because, uh, as a starting point, is because it leverages something that's very, very true, which is, that our intuitions about probability are generally kind of terrible. We weren't built to reason about this stuff at a very good level. Um, but to explain what I think is cognitively going on and why, how, what we can do about it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by whining about sort of a popular answer that you'll hear all the time. This is one of these things that drives me completely nuts and makes me cry every time because I'm easily made to cry. Um, you'll be sitting there watching a reality TV show, and they'll be down to the finals. And there'll be two people who've battled up through the ranks by you know, cooking excellent meals or whatever it is they were doing. And they'll be there, and one of them, out, out of one of their mouths will come, well, I guess there's two of us left, so I guess it's 50-50. Really? I mean, really? That's what you think? Is that somehow you're going to give your best effort in this final and there's going to be a coin flip? It? No, right? That isn't, that isn't a thing. I mean, hopefully you're, you believe your odds are better than 50-50. If you think they're worse than 50-50, you can say that too. But it, it, isn't, it isn't chance here, right? I mean, you, you believe that the judges are doing something, or at least I hope you believe the judges are doing something. Maybe they just know something about reality shows I don't. I don't know. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But assuming they don't, then you know, that isn't how probability works. But it does uncover an important truth. It does uncover an important intuition about how we think probability works, right? <laughs> Which is that we use probability as um, a proxy for a lot of different kinds of reasoning. Um, you'll hear the statement, you know, weathermen will say there's a 70% probability of rain. Well, they actually mean something sort of measurable and quantifiable about that that's a little different from what you mean when you say, well, it'll probably rain, right? Probably here is serving as a proxy for likelihood, for uncertainty, for a bunch of things where it's like, you know, I think it's going to rain, but I'm not certain, right? And that's perfectly legitimate. You know, there's a lot of English words, not just probably, that we use in all kinds of different informal and formal ways in various contexts. It's not like you should feel dumb for using it that way. But you should away be aware of the difference between that and the weather person's, you know, oh, there's a 55% chance of rain or a 70% chance of rain. Intuitively, um, where does that second statement, the weather person statement, where does that come from? Um, you know, how did, how did the weather person get to 70%? Is it about atmospheric conditions before it rains in the past? Ah, they did some measurements, right? They said, you know what? We can look at this atmospheric con set of atmospheric conditions, this history of the last few days, whatever it is we're looking at, and we can say that when things were like this, then 70% of the time, a prediction of rain would have been correct. That's a pretty formal statement. It's also a weird kind of statement because it almost starts to sound like machine learning, 
and we will absolutely get there, right? I mean, what's the difference between that and, oh, I've fed a neural network a bunch of past weather data, and now it's saying it will rain, you know, with some strength, right? Well, one of the differences is that we have some intuition that this 70% thing is a thing, that it's accurately predicting a probability of it raining. Um, that's more formal and more justifiable than our it will probably rain. I'm going to argue there's some holes in that, too. It gets really complicated. I mean, let's think about a roughly equivalent statement that I think is an interesting statement to think about. And that's the statement that, oh, there's probably a solution to this math problem, right? That's the kind of thing we say all the time, right? Oh, I can see there's probably a proof of this theorem. What could that possibly mean, though? Right? I mean, does it mean that 70% of the time when I've seen a theorem like this, there's been a proof? I mean, probably not, right? Because I don't quite know how I would do that or measure that, right? There almost certainly either is or isn't a proof, and it has nothing to do with coin flips or die rolls or past, prob past theorems predicting future results, right? And yet we feel comfortable making it because what we really mean is, oh yeah, I've seen a class of problems that are like this, and a lot of times I or my friends or the smartest people in the world have been able to supply proofs for things that are kind of like this. That's OK. Um, and it leads to an interesting kind of question, an interesting kind of discussion, because um, let's see, where did I put my next bits? Oh yeah. Um, it leads to this notion of sort of the relationship between probability and statistics, right? Statistics is sort of the art of taking these measurements. It's an experimentalish science. You take these measurements and you ask what they imply about, other, about things you didn't measure. Um, probability sort of I think of as being more principled than that. It's we derive from first principles what the statistics would tell you if you were to measure things. And, um, you know, the, the, the classic thing that, I love this XKCD, it's, it's a total geek's XKCD as most of the best ones are, but, you know, the classic thing is you've got a thing filled with red and black balls, right? Um, and, uh, and you ask, well, what's the probability you'll pull a black ball out of it? And the thing for some reason is, an, is always an urn. If you look at any textbook, it's always been an urn since the dawn of time. And I don't know why. And obviously, he doesn't know either. Um, Randall doesn't know either because, yeah. Um, so, um, but, you know, for whatever reason you're pulling stuff out of this urn, you know, there's two things you could do, right? You could, one, say, well, I'm just going to pull things out of urns a bunch of times and do some statistics, and I'll find out that nine out of 15 times I'll get a black ball. The other thing I could do is just look at the setup and say, oh, look, you know, from this setup, I can deduce that if you did a bunch of trials, right, uh, if I did a bunch of trials at the end of time, I would find that nine out of 15 times I pulled a black ball. I'm going to concentrate on the second thing today, but there's an important point here, which is that you have to notice the difference. There's a bunch of differences between those things. Um, one of the differences, so, um, you know, if you look in a grade school math textbook, literally in a grade school math textbook, they'll tell you, oh yeah, the probability of an event, what's an event? Something that happens when you try something is the number of times the event occurs divided by the number of trials in which that event could have occurred. That's accurate. It's a thing. I mean, I can't argue with it. But I would argue that it doesn't provide a ton of intuition for a bunch of really interesting reasons um, that make even professional philosophers uncomfortable. By the way, if you, uh, in the news recently was somebody who from Harvard who is doing a class in the philosophy of probability. That should tell you that there's enough to say about this topic to fill 12 weeks at Harvard. Um, <laughs> I'll give you what I can. Um, so first of all, you, know, you, you notice what that really says. That says, well, if I did this experiment and did t trials, I would expect to see probability of e of those trials, you know, percent of those trials actually produce you know, if I, if, I, if I did a bunch of trials, I would expect to see 9 out of 15 of them produce a red ball, a black ball, kind of, right? But not exactly, right? Because it's random. And what I sort of believe is that in the limit, as I do more and more and more trials, right, the approximation 9 over 15 gets better and 
you know, gets closer and closer and closer to being statistically true. Well, how fast does that happen? How much, if I did 100 trials of this experiment, you know, what are the odds that I'd get exactly, um, why can't I do this in my head? Um, nine fifteenths. Oh, because it's math is hard, right? If I did two hundred, <laughs> if I did two hundred and twenty-five trials, what's the odds that I'd get exactly one hundred thirty-five black balls? Right? <laughs> there we go. Math isn't that hard. You just have to cheat. Um, you know, very low, right? Uh, on the other hand, if I did two hundred twenty-five million trials, I expect that I'd get. Well, again, the odds that I'd get exactly one hundred thirty-five million black balls, right, are almost zero. Oh, but percentage-wise, I get more and more accurate. By the way, there's a great rule of thumb that if you take nothing away from the talk else, you might take this old rule of thumb away, which is that the accuracy, the percentage accuracy increases like roughly the square root of the number of trials. It's a terrible rule of thumb that statisticians, statis, makes stat, statisticians cry um, because it's so unjustifiable except that it just turns out to be the, a thing in the, <laughs> in the world. Um, so now we're dealing with second order probabilities, right? Probabilities of getting a particular probability. Yuck. That's why we won't do statistics today, because once you go down that road, then we've got a math class, and nobody wants to sit through a math class in a conference like this one. But um, so that's one reason that this whole definition should make you nervous. Another reason that it should make you nervous is because there's this thing that pops up at about this point every time anybody talks about po probability, which is where people's heads sometimes start to hurt, and they start to wander away um, disappointed that it's all too annoying. Um, and that's this notion of independent versus dependent events. So in that previous thing, I'm, each trial is an independent trial of a single thing, right? I, I pull out a black ball, and then with replacement, which by the way was the color text for that comic, um, <laughs> the, if I try with replacement, put the black ball back, my odds the next time are exactly the same. There's no, there's no relationship between the two trials, except that they're from the same system. Um, so if I flip a coin and then I flip another coin, you know, the odds that the second coin will become heads has nothing to do with the first coin or vice versa. They're completely unrelated in any way. They're independent. On the other hand, if I flip a coin, the odds that it will um, turn up tails is very dependent on the odds that it will turn up heads, right? <laughs> I mean, if you, I, I really can pretty much predict one from the other. Um, and uh, you know, most things, and this is what makes it awkward, are somewhere in between. They're not completely dependent or completely independent, right? Everything's kind of related. Um, there again, think about the case of pulling balls out of my urn without replacement, right? That first time, the, the probability that I'll get a black ball is 9 out of 15, right? The second time, the probability isn't 9 out of 15. If I pulled a black ball out the first time, it's 8 out of 15. If I pulled a red ball out, it's 10 out of 8 out of 14. And otherwise, it's uh, 9 out of 14, right? Neither one of which is quite 9 out of 15, but it's close. <laughs> and so the game we're going to play is we're going to play this game of sort of trying to get close. And that's going to be one of the tricks that real you know, geeks and engineers use to avoid having to do statistics. is to say, well, we'll do approximate hand wavy statistics. And when those get too hard, then we'll consult a professional mathematician or change the problem. The second thing preferable. <gasps> so if we aren't doing statistics, then you know, where are these principled sources of this probability? Right? I said, I'm not going to do this by measuring trials and then trying to predict things. That's kind of a lie I will a little bit, but mostly. I'm mostly going to say, well, they come from principled places. And there's sort of three places I would identify as obvious places for probabilities to come from. Um, one of those places is quantum, right? That famous stocking horse of writers and <laughs> philosophers and pseudo-sages everywhere is, oh, it's quantum. You know, Terry Pratchett made that phrase famous. Um, and, uh, but it's real, right? As far as we can tell, and I could now give you a 20-minute digression involving Bell's, Bell's uh, inequality and the aspect experiments and blah, 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 which to me leads to the conclusion that it's not as solid as you'd hope. And a lot of other physicists are concluding the same way these days. But for 40 years, it was very strongly accepted by all physicists that quantum stuff is really random. 
in the sense that there's no better, that, that each individual quantum event is independent of every other quantum event. If I, you know, put Schrodinger's poor old cat in the box again, <sighs> poor cat. I wish, I wish they'd chosen anything but a cat because that's what made this meme so strong. But, uh, <laughs> You know, if, if, I, if I wait for some quantum event and then observe the outcome and there's a 50-50 chance, there really is a 50-50 chance. It's independent of any other trial. It's independent of any other conditions. It's just really honestly 50-50. So random pops up in the real world, yeah. So um, quantum physics is what replaced Newtonian physics as a thing to some extent by pointing out that at very small scales, um, you can't actually observe anything very definitively. So the, maybe the best thing, I really am going to end up with that, with the aspect experiment, aren't I? Um, look, Heisenberg noticed really early on that if you try to measure, for example, the speed at which a particle is moving and its position, well, the only way to do that is to sort of bounce something off it to see what's going on. But that changes its you know, speed or its position. I can't really know both of these things at the same time, it turns out. This is Heisenberg's famous inequality. All I can do is there's some probability of a particular speed or position that's uncertain. I don't know everything. If I look at a radioactive decay, then in principle, the radioactive decay will or will not happen in a given second with some probability. And it really is really random in some physicist's sense of random, where there's no like, underlying mechanism that's what the aspect experiment and Bell's inequality purport to say, is that there's no underlying mechanism that explains whether it happens in that second or not. No matter what I tried to measure, no matter how I tried to figure out whether the decay was going to happen, it, I can't. All I can know is that it will happen with this probability. Um, and so if I want a source of random numbers, this goes back to last year's talk, a really good place to get them is from a Geiger counter. I sit there and put a radioactive source in, and um, I wait for clicks to happen or not happen in a given second. That turns out to be really unpredictable, really, really random. It's a thing. And so that gives me a really honest to gosh probability from first principles. I can sit there in principle, although not in practice, as a physicist, I can sit there and calculate. I should see 150 clicks per second, more than likely. Of course, I won't, because it's what we talked about before, right? I won't see exactly 150 sec clicks per second. Some seconds I'll see more, some seconds I'll see less. As I have more and more atoms, by the way, I have 10 to the 23rd in this. St stupid sample atoms, which is a heck of a lot of atoms, so things are going to converge really nicely, and I really will see just about exactly 150 clicks per second. But um, it won't be perfect, because chance is weird. So that's one source. The next source um, that I would identify is even in the pre-quantum universe, even in the Newtonian universe, right? The Newtonian universe was a very disturbing place for philosophers, right? And part of the reason is that, in principle, the Newtonian universe left nothing to chance. There was not only no chance, there was no nothing. It was completely deterministic. You know, the famous image here is God's clockwork. He set his clock running. It just, the clockwork plays out. Um, you have no free will at some level, because every motion of every atom in a Newtonian universe is determined by its previous state. The thing runs forward deterministically. The interesting thing about that is it doesn't mean you can measure it. It doesn't mean you could ever calculate that, right? Um, the motions of something as complicated as the Earth-Moon Sun system are so complicated to calculate that they might as well be random um, for all practical purposes because nobody knows how to do an accurate computation. And that's with three bodies, right, three particles. Now you think of the number of particles, again, 10 to the 23rd in your mole of gas in a jar. It's not random in a, you know, from a Newtonian view, but you might as well treat it as random because you don't really have any choice. It's chaotic. It's incomputable. The third sort of source of randomness that you need to think about is um, you know, one of my favorite moments in The Simpsons is, uh, is uh, Bart, Lisa thinking, oh, poor Bart, he always picks rock, you know? And Lisa, uh, Bart, good old rock, I can always count on rock, right? Um, the, if I want to play rock, scissors, paper with you, it turns out I can't behave deterministically. That would be a really, really 
bad idea. So I better find some way to act randomly if I want to have any success, you know, at least somewhat randomly, if I want to have any success in that game. If randomness didn't exist, we would have to invent it. If there weren't probabilities, we would have to cough up some from somewhere because we would have to make this kind of trickery work. Um, we'll quantify all that in a bit. How, about, how long do I have, by the way? What's the, what's the schedule? You've got about, you've got about 20, uh, shade under 20. Okay, shade under 20. So I need to finish in 15 because the, well, I want to leave some time to talk about stuff. Got it. So here's the sort of bog standard laws of probability that you'll see in a book. Um, they're worth reviewing because they let us compute some things. And you know, you should, these should become your friend if you care about this stuff because it's really, they're really, really useful. First of all, probabilities obviously, just from the definition earlier, should always be between 0 and 1 inclusive. I can't really have something happen more than every time I try it, or less than zero times in all the trials. Um, and so I would be really surprised if, if this probability wasn't in that range. Um, the other thing is if the events are, if you consider all the independent outcomes, all the independent events that can happen as the result of some trial, the probabilities of all those things better add up to one. On every trial, something happens, right? Um, if, I, if I add up the probability that the coin will flip heads and the probability will flip tails, well, the sum better be one because one of those things should happen on every trial, right? Um, and the last thing is, um, and we could spend literally an hour proving all this. You'll just have to take my word for it. As long as the two events I'm thinking about are independent events, then the probability that they'll both happen is the probability that one will happen times the probability the other will happen. Similarly, if the events are independent, then the problem that um, one or the other um, or both of those events will happen, that's the programmer's or, the inclusive or, um, is the probability the first one will happen plus the probability the second one will happen. These are simple laws, right? They're not very complicated. Well, they turn out to be a little complicated to apply. And one of the reasons is that um, things aren't independent, typically. Um, typically, things do depend on other things. What a surprise. You know, the, the, it isn't a world of independently flipping coins. Oh, who, who knew? Um, so um, we write that. This is the probability that this event happens given that this other condition happened first. Um, and we're going to use that notation to make things easier to think about. And we're going to use this definition that sort of defines that notation. The probability that both E and C happen is the probability that C happens times the probability that E happens given that C happened. right? Because that's the way that, that makes sense, right? The probability that, 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 you know, that I tripped and fell down is the probability that I tripped you know, times the probability that I fell down given that I tripped, right? That's, that's fine. That's good. It's not that complicated. I promised you the math wouldn't be very hard and that you could gloss over it if you wanted to. Here's the not very hard math you can gloss over. Here's the hardest math we're going to do. This is Reverend Bayes' math. The Reverend Thomas Bayes was an interesting guy of the 1800s who pointed out that you can derive pretty easily through algebra I won't do because of lack of time, that the probability that the condition was held, given that you saw the event, the probability that you saw me um, you know, fall down, that, that I tripped given that you saw me fall down, is the probability that I would fall down when tripped times the probability that I would trip divided by the probability that I would fall down for some other reason, right? The, uh, fall down for any reason, right? Maybe I fell down in astonishment. Um, and this turns out to be really useful as a thing to calculate, and I'll show you why in a minute, because it lets us figure out what must have happened to make something, what most likely happened to make something be true. Um, that's called diagnosis. We like diagnosis. Diagnosis is a good thing, and this is one of the ways we can use probability. By the way, that's the signature of the Reverend uh, Thomas Bayes, um, if you want to, you can go find the portrait of the Re Reverend Thomas Bayes online, except the first place it ever appeared was in 1936, and nobody really believes it's his portrait. Um, but you'll find it hundreds of places, the, the picture of Thomas Bayes that probably actually isn't Thomas Bayes. Um, but the signature is known to be his signature. Um, so yeah. Um, Here's a sidetrack. We, we, we did a lot of math. Let's do something that's more fun. Um, 
Let's talk about non-transitive dice. How many of you have seen non-transitive dice before? Oh, only a few of you. Good. That's what I was hoping, is that one would at least be kind of a surprise for all y'all. Um, look, suppose I have a pair of dice, right? And I roll the two dice, and I declare whichever die rolled the higher number the winner, right? Very simple game, children's game, right? Very, very fun um, for about 12 seconds. Um, we have an intuition. Obviously, you know, what are the odds, what's the probability that I will win if I take two ordinary six-sided dice with the numbers one through six on them? You know, what's the odds that I'll win? 50%, right? How, how, how do I know that 50% was the right answer? Symmetry, right? And it depends a lot on what we de declare a tie. Um, you know, I, I guess you know, what I'll really do is tie 1 36th of the time and, uh, or no, 6 36th, 1 6th of the time. And the other, the other uh, 5 6 of the time, one of us will win. But it, if we decided that die A was better, that they're identical dice, then we could switch them and that wouldn't make any sense. So it must be that the odds are the same for both sides. And from that, if you have any intuition about how these things work, it becomes obvious, you know, let's say that I built a different die, one that had all sixes and the other one that had all ones on it. What are the odds that the six die would beat the one die? 100%, right? I sort of can't lose. I, I want to gamble on those odds if I can get a chance. Um, I'll give you any odds you want. Um, so from that, you naturally, because intuition does that, get this notion of dominant die, right? Oh, this die is better than that die. And if I wanted to have a gambling competition, right, then um, I should figure out which die is better and use that one as my die. And my opponent can use their die, which is worse, and I will win, right? Here's a cool thing. So let's compute the odds that, um, and by the way, I, I, I use Efron's dice because they're particularly easy to understand. But um, there's lots of non-transitive dice. You should go read the Wikipedia article on non-transitive dice. It's kind of awesome. What are the odds that die A will be die B in this scenario? These are the six sides of the A die and the six sides of the B die. If, I, if I'm playing with A and you're playing with B, what, what are my odds? Two thirds. Why? Well, because B always rolls three. And you know, two thirds of the time, this one rolls four. It's not very hard to compute. Oh, let's do the same computation again for the B and the C die. Um, who wins there? Well, that's harder, but not that much harder. It's the same, really. Um, two thirds of the time, the B die beats the C die, and one third, the C die beats. Yeah? So A is better than B by two thirds to one third. B is better than C by two thirds to one third. Let's ask about C and D. Better by two thirds to one third? Why, yes, it turns out it is. Now, there you'd have to do the math a little bit. There's 50-50 that this will be uh, 5, in which case it loses 1 third of the time. And it's 50-50, it'll be a 1, in which case it always loses. So it loses 1 sixth of the time over here and, you know, one, and half the time because of this. So um, this wins 2 thirds of the time. Woohoo! Uh-oh. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Now let's compare die D and die A. Uh, die A, it looks like, by the same argument, loses to die D 50, two thirds of the time. Oh. So the best die to pick is clearly, oh wait, no. What's the best thing? How do you win this game? You pick second, right? <laughs> Warren Buffett is apparently really fond of intransitive dice, according to some stuff I read on Wikipedia, and is, loves to try to get people to play this game with him, with a set of non-transitive dice, um, just to gloat when he wins. Um, <laughs> is this intuitive? Probably not, right? You wouldn't expect that there would be sets of mutually dominating dice, right? What's the smallest such set you could possibly have? Three, right? Because two, there again, we just made the argument that two, this couldn't possibly work for. Well, die A beats B by two thirds, and B beats A by two thirds doesn't make any sense. But if you have more than two, then things can go in a circle like that. It's really a weird thing. But if I sit there and do the math, 
compute the probabilities using those rules I just talked about, um, then I find out what's going on. Um, I don't have time. I ran out of time. I thought I didn't have enough too much material, and I was wrong. Here's some things you can do. Here's some things you can do really fast. I know, and I'd like to save five to talk. Um, I will reserve five. Let's see. Spam filtering. This is something I did some years ago because it was really popular for everybody to do. Um, the the um, you sit there and make a bunch of measurements of what features ham messages have and what features spam messages have so that you can find out what's, what spam's like and what's ham's like. And so what you get from that is probabilities, right? K percent, you know, 12 percent of spam messages have red text and only 3 percent of non-spam messages, of ham messages. By the way, that's a thing. Um, and now you've got all these features, but now what you want to do is go the other way around. You want to predict the probability that you've got a spam given all these measured features. How do you do that? Remember Reverend Bayes back there? We're going to flip everything around and just do this math. And what we do is we compare the probability that it's spam and the probability that it's ham, and, that, and we pick whichever is larger as the prediction of what it is. This is how a lot of spam filtering has worked for a really long time. It's a key component of such systems. You can use the same plan for medical diagnosis. You can use the same plan for predicting user preferences in an interface. Um, it's a really powerful technique, and it's really easy. All you have to do to be able to do this kind of machine learning, which is called naive Bayesian machine learning for reasons we don't have time to talk about, is to Bayesian's obvious, the naive is less, um, is is all you have to do is count things, right? You have to have a training set and you count its elements. Wow, that's really easy. Um, I missed something here. Uh, no, the non-transitive dice, basically, yeah, okay, fine, 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 fine. The last thing is, um, you know, I mentioned games. Um, you know, you'd like to be able to know, well, how do I play rock, scissors, paper, right? Everybody knows, right? What's the answer? How do I play rock, scissors, paper? To optimally. <laughs> what? But how do, I, how do I guarantee that I'm going to do, that my opponent can't beat me up in rock, scissors, paper? <laughs> <laughs> so there's an interesting thing that's going on here, and we should talk about it. Um, but. The point is that if I randomly pick each one third of the time, you will never do better than even against me. If I, if I actually am random and just say, oh, I'll pick rock one third, paper one third, scissors one third, then the best you can do is tie me, no matter what your strategy is. That's an easy thing to prove. Um, it's not a big deal proof to prove that. So if I want to guarantee if I want the best possible outcome against an ideal opponent, one who plays as strongly as possible, my best plan is to play with even odds of these things. Let me show you a different game. So, and we, we model this with what's called a payoff matrix. Um, this thing, this green text in the middle says, you know, for rock versus rock, the payoff is zero, we tie. For rock versus uh, paper, the minimizer, um, which is the person playing the rows here, wins, uh, loses because the score is one, um, the maximizer wins, and so forth. And so we can build this payoff matrix that says, you know, how many points you get for each of these outcomes. And from that, you can run this through some code, which the URL was up there, some code I wrote on GitHub, that's on GitHub, that actually calculates and shows you that the right strategy is for each of them to pick, both sides to pick randomly. Yeah? OK, here's the interesting part. I played a game as a kid, it's still around, that had a combat system whose payoff matrix looked like this. Because you were the hero, you got two points for this one combination. But otherwise, it's just like rock, scissors, paper. But the hero gets to beat up the monster a little bit. Now, there's a couple natural questions you might ask about this. First of all, what's my best strategy, playing the hero or playing the monster? for this. Is there even a best strategy? Yeah, it turns out there is. And it turns out it's randomized. In this funny bonus version of game of paper where you have super scissors, um, the, um, one side has super scissors. 
it turns out that this is the probabilities you should use. The maximizer, the guy who gets the, the, the person who gets the two, the two should play this 25% of the time, this 33% of the time, and this 42% of the time. And the other side, the side that's the victim here, should be playing this 25% of the time, this 33% of the time, and this 42% of the time. And it turns out that's optimal. And then if you both play that way, the value of this game is 0.08 to the maximizer. That is, for every um, 100 games played, the maximizer will win eight more the, you know, games than the minimizer will. Oh, uh, weird, right? The generalization of this is a really important thing. This kind of problem comes up a lot in the real world. I'm happy to have had my child, children problem solved. But it, this kind of thing comes up in the real world, too. And there's a lot of thought been put into this. That calculation, by the way, was done from a book from the Rand Corporation from the 50s that this guy wrote. It's like, it's like very Cold War era stuff. And, uh, but it gives a really nice algorithm for computing these guys. I think I'm about done. Um, obviously, everybody knew how the Monday Hall problem came out. But let me suggest there's some nice mathematical intuition here. If this probability is 1 third for staying with the door you're on, because it is, because it hasn't changed, and this probability is 0, because now I've seen a goat, and the probabilities have to add up behind 1 to 1, because the prize is behind some door, what must the probability of this be? Well, it must be 2 thirds, right? Because what else could it be? That's all that's left. And so obviously, you should switch. You'll win twice as often. Um, the point is, your intuition may fail you. The math is maybe less likely to fail you. Um, so that's what I had to tell you. I hope it's useful. I hope it was interesting. Um, we'll take whatever time is left, which is very, very little. And if there are questions or comments or concerns, let's chat about them.